All right, a uh, very warm welcome to everyone this evening. So this is our event today, so we're going to have Future Architects discuss choosing materials for a sustainable future. So just before we get started, just a little bit of, kind of housekeeping. So we will be recording this session for those who can't join us. So we're uploading this to Future Architects playlist on YouTube in due course as well. As this evening is event is a Microsoft Teams meeting, please keep your mic muted and camera off at all times just to keep things moving and make it easier to edit later. Each speaker is going to have around about 15 minutes to present. We're going to have four fantastic speakers for this event and there'll be lots of time for questions at the end. So if you want to ask anything, please feel very free to throw that in the chat box. There is no such thing as a stupid question and all of them are very, very welcome. So RIBA Future Architects is a community for future and emerging architects to offer advice and information about studying architecture and RIBA student mentoring scheme. So this also includes events and opportunities as the network is designed to support you, inspire and provide a voice as you transition from study to practice. So just to introduce myself, I'm, my name is uh, Scott McCauley, uh, he, him. I'm going to be your host for this evening. I'm a climate justice activist, first and foremost, architectural designer, and I founded the Anthropocene Architecture School about two and a half years ago in response to architecture's kind of lasting inertia in the face of the climate emergency. So just for a little bit of context, we have just kind of wrapped up COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, commitments that have been made have not been on par with what is necessary. Uh, the commitments made and targets do not keep us below the 1.5 degrees threshold that has been agreed by the UN, the Paris Agreement. So as construction accounts for about 40% of kind of global CO2 emissions and use about 50% of extracted raw materials, what you choose to put in your projects and your buildings and your work is incredibly important. And it's not just about choosing the one, uh, the ideal material. There is no silver bullet solution. It's all about choosing the right material for the right, the right, right purpose in the right place. So it's all on a case by case basis. So this evening we're going to have four fantastic speakers to take you through different things from setting the wider context through to using what's on site as well. So I will be kind of introducing and moderating a little bit and keeping things moving. But please throw any questions you have and would like to ask into the chat box. And if you follow that as well, there will be links and such from the speakers as we go. So I think that's us kind of started introductions wise. I am going to be talking as little as possible and leaving that to our speakers to really lead on and enjoy. So first of all, we're going to have, uh, make sure I get all my things right. Uh, Kieran Pereira is going to be our first speaker. So Kieran is the author of the book Sand Stories. So surprising truths about the global sand quit crisis and the quest for sustainable solutions. And she's the founder of sandstories.org. She works as a social entrepreneur to find and promote solutions to the global sand crisis. Her work has been featured in the award-winning documentary Sand Wars and in media such as The Economist, BBC Radio 5, Al Jazeera, Financial Times, ZDF Magazine Royale, CNBC Digital, among others as well. And Kieran is based in London. So I'm going to pass to Kieran and you can take it away and I will give a slight warning on time if we need be, but if not, we'll leave that to you as well. So yeah, carry it away. Thank you so much, Scott. Can, are you able to see the slide? Uh, yep, the slides are up. We're all good. Oh, perfect. Okay. So uh, once again, thank you so much for having me. It's a <clears throat> pleasure and a privilege to be part of this event. Um, just want to say that I am still recovering from a cold and a cough, so I, uh, I have a sore throat. I'll do my best to try and uh, take things slow, not cough. Um, but if I do, I, I request your <laughs> I, uh, my apologies in advance. So um, we're here to talk about sand, uh, but the context really matters. Um, as many of you might know, 2020 was a year where scientists published this particular study where the global human man-made mass, human-made mass um, exceeds all living biomass. Um, in 2019, the United Nations Environment Programme published a report on sand and sustainability. Um, and this particular report uh, highlighted that the scale of the challenge makes it one of the major sustainability challenges of the 21st century. Um, <clears throat> from my research, I found that sand is used in incredibly number in an incredible number of ways, um, but there are certain facts that complicate the matters. A, sand is a non-renewable resource in human timescales. It is generated in uh, in nature, but along geological timescales. Um, two, uh, specific uses require very specific types of sand, and these types of sand eventually come from very specific places. So supply is not as unlimited as we'd like, as we, you know, uh, like to believe. 
Um, so be and because of because uh, different kinds of sands cannot be interchanged as easily, you know, when you hear people saying, oh, but there's plenty of sand in the Sahara, that's not true uh, because this particular sand is not suitable for construction. The grains are too, far too rounded and they don't offer structural uh, cohesion and strength in concrete. Um, so the top users that I have found are uh, construction land reclamation industry and energy sector. Technically, you, these are just divided into construction and uh, industry, but I thought it best to also tease out the energy sector because uh, the energy sector uh, get takes a lion's share of policies and stuff like that. And I think there's it's worth uh, looking at it quite closely. So construction, of course, you're familiar with concrete. Concrete is about 60, um, uh, 65 to 70 percent sand and gravel. Um, <clears throat> and even if we talk about things like glass, flat glass is about 70% silica sand, uh, land reclamation and you know, processes like that, beach nourishment, things like that require enormous volumes of sand that's extracted from somewhere. And when it's extracted from somewhere, it's always um, comes from, it, it has a cost attached, which, we, which is currently not recognized. Um, when we talk about industry, uh, for or most of the metal objects produced around us are produced through a, a system called sand casting. So for every ton of molten metal that's poured, we require about three to six tons of highly specialized types of sand. Um, and the energy sector, for example, methods like, of course, uh, fracking. A, a typical fracking well can use anywhere from 50 to 70 rail cars of sand. A supersized fracking well can use anywhere from 100 to 250 plus rail cars of sand. The entire fracking process can last uh, th 35 to 40 days. Sometimes it can go up to 60 days, but we're talking about a resource that is millions of years old. So that kind of puts it in context that just the sheer imbalance between how long nature takes to form this resource and the way humans consume it. So why does it matter? Why are we talking about this now? The 20th century saw a 23 fold increase in natural resources used for building. Clearly, this trajectory is definitely not sustainable, right? Um, but there are other factors for you to consider. You might see a lot of shrill headlines that say, oh, we're running out of sand. Well, technically speaking, in the physical sense, we may not be running out of sand in, um, <clears throat> in, in some places. Uh, 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 sand might be still present. However, it may not be available for extraction because of competing uses. For example, you see here, um, scientists did this uh, study of the Belgian co continental shelf, and you see that the uh, coarse fraction of sand, given the n different number of competing uses, um, is, is not available. It's, uh, it's, it, at the most, it could run out in 80 years time. And this particular GIF does not even consider fishing, uh, habitat for fishing. So you can see it's quite a busy area. We extract sand from land based resources, from riverbeds, river banks in developing uh, economies and in developed economies, largely also from the seabed. Um, and this growing trajectory is definitely a problem. We need to look at how we can reduce uh, our sand consumption. I don't expect you to be able to read this, but just uh, this is these images are from the book just to show you that um, because of the scale and the pace and the, uh, of, of our sand extraction, it intersects with every single one of the sustainable development goals. Um, and this is uh, part of the book. And there are huge uh, my mining affected communities across across the globe. These are some examples from South, uh, South Asia. People are losing their ancestral lands. They're losing their livelihoods. They're losing uh, water security, food security, it, it is a huge growing problem. In Morocco, for example, <clears throat> you find that a lot of tourists travel uh, travel there for the beaches, but you find that uh, beaches are being mined uh, extensively in order to build facilities for the tourists. So there's this whole um, um, you know, imbalance in the in the way um, and the supply chain is not transparent. There's very little visibility, so it's a problem. 
In Canary Islands, you, you find that many of the beaches that are replenished, that sand is actually coming from occupied uh, territory of Western Sahara. Um, and so there are huge human right uh, implications here for this, this kind of resource use. But I don't want it to seem like this particular problem is somewhere out there far away. Uh, you will also find that it's a hugely contested resource, even, even here in the UK, for example, in Northern Ireland. Um, <clears throat> this particular site, as of, as of October 2020, this particular operation is, uh, is a licensed legal operation. However, what you need to know is that this particular site is, uh, it has the right labels. It is a European Special Protection Area. It is a Ramsar site, which, is, which means it's an internationally recognized uh, a, a, a important wetland. It's a site of special scientific interest and yet despite this there's mining activity, um, extraction activity that's kind of driving um, uh, you know huge uh, loss of biodiversity and wildlife in this particular site. <clears throat> you have the good bin sands for example if uh, if you've, uh, this particular uh, it's, it lies between the it lies in the English Channel between England and France um, and there's a huge controversy about uh, the Dover, Dover Harbour, Harbour Board uh, wanting to dredge uh, millions of tons of sand from this particular site. And it's contentious because the site is uh, hugely significant uh, in, in historical, in cultural terms yeah, and in biological uh, terms as well. Uh, many brave soldiers um, gave up their lives and uh, and their remains. It's a war grave, basically. So there are lots of people, uh, human remains uh, from from wars and previous shipwrecks and stuff like that in this particular site. And um, and so the question that arises is: Should we be, sh you know, uh, should should we be extracting sand from such places of such significance? Um, the Goodwin Sands. Cons uh, I urge you to visit the websites that I've listed in the source. Um, the Goodwin Sands Conservation Trust is now working on um, increasing awareness about the, the importance of these sands, how they protect the coast from further erosion, and what, what we stand to lose if we extract sand. Other practices such as land reclamation, for example, are also hugely huge consumers of sand. Here you see images from Indonesia where uh, fishermen were trying to stop a dredger, and these are massive, massive ships, right? They're really um, on the the picture on the right. You see um, a market where twenty thousand fishermen sell their catch. So obviously, when you dredge sand, uh, you disrupt the habitat of fish um, significantly, and so this impact has a massive impact on all their livelihoods. Yes, you might create new jobs and you might create new, but the kind of jobs that you are creating are significantly different to, and it comes at the expense of the livelihood of uh, people like these fishermen. Especially since we are talking to a group of uh, future architects, I think it's very important for you to also know that we extract pigments, uh, minerals for, uh, that go into pigments uh, for paints. Um, and they often come from developing economies like Madagascar, Vietnam, uh, Sierra Leone, India, other places. And all these places, each of these cases are hugely, hugely problematic. In this particular case, I've highlighted the case of Madagascar. Uh, I'd invite you to follow the work of this charity, Andrew Lee's Trust. Uh, they point, they've been campaigning for the last 25 years. Um, they point out how this particular company violated national law. They they uh, <clears throat> uprooted the forest in order to gain uh, access to the minerals underneath. They encroached upon the lake of uh, Lake Bezeroy. And this particular uh, buffer was set aside actually to protect the health of people. Um, so now what the charity says is that the waters where people fish and uh, you know the, that they are completely dependent upon and there is a there the levels of uranium and lead that you find in the waters is 50 times more than is higher than uh, what the WHO permits. Uh, so despite the fact that this particular company violated national law, it hasn't there haven't been no repercussions. In 2011, 
uh, over a thousand village claimants uh, decided to come together to file a class action suit, a lawsuit, and they were assisted by a, U a UK human rights law firm. Um, <clears throat> however, the company paid off uh, over 50% of the claimants, so there were not enough people to sustain the case. Um, so, and if you look at, um, you may be familiar with the concept of carbon offsets, right? So, uh, so in order to green the mine, they kind of locked out people out of this particular area, but there was no prior informed consent. Uh, and so it, people found themselves locked out of spaces where they you previously grew food, where they harvested wood to make their traditional dugout pirogues, like you can see in the picture, where they, where they harvested medicines. Um, all of this they were locked out of because they were not allowed to. It was it was saved for carbon offsetting, so it can be hugely problematic. And the provenance of the of the materials we use in our built environment is very very important to consider. I don't want to be uh, don't want to leave you with just you know the negative news. I also want to talk about some solutions and some solutions, for example, uh, you find that the city of Amsterdam, for example, has mandated that new housing is to be, um, you know, new projects to be completed with wood or other bio-based materials. France has done something similar. Um, so there is hope, there is action happening. In uh, And the United Nations uh, Environment Report that came out in 2019, it was hugely influential in two um, UNEA 4 resolutions. UNEA 4, UNEA is the United Nations Environment Assembly. This is the world's highest uh, level of decision making for the environment. It, en it enjoys universal membership of all UN um, members. Um, and so uh, it has been influential in two resolutions, which is one for mineral resource governance and sustainable infrastructure. And I know for a fact that the, uh, team, the Grid Geneva and the UNEP team is also working on presenting another report to uh, the next UNEA, which is scheduled to happen early next year. So change is happening um, ever so slowly, but I think it needs to be complemented by a change at all scales and wherever we can. And so um, I'll leave you with this with these thoughts. Um, if you would wish to uh, learn more, these are the resources that I would recommend. Feel free to reach out to me in uh, on any of these uh, uh, links. And uh, I think with that, I'll hand over. Thank you very much and um, hand over. Oh, thank you very much. That was fantastic. Thank you very much for the really broad scale view on where our materials come from and the things we don't see when we specify. So that's fantastic. Right now we are going to introduce our second speaker for this evening. So Amira, Amira Ayub is going to be speaking to us and Amira is passionate about changing the world and creating a resilient future for future generations. And this entails raising awareness about global climate change issues and connecting people to nature, education and designing pilot projects as well. She is an architect, a sustainability and healthy building consultant, a USGBC lead and well faculty, as well as a Living Future Ambassador and was recognised by the International Living Future Institute as a Living Future Hero as well. She was nominated by the UNFCCC with over 100 visionary thinkers and interdisciplinary thought leaders from around the world to join the Resilience Frontier Initiative and co-create visions of desirable climate resilient futures beyond 2030. And these outcomes are going to feed into the work of the UN systems as well. So thank you very much for dialing in and giving us your time. And I'm really looking forward to seeing this as well. So I will toss the buck across. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, uh, Scott, for inviting me and thank you everyone for being here to tonight. I am I'm so much honored to to be with you here tonight. I would like to share my screen. Please let me know if you can see it. Uh, yep, everything's all good. Awesome. Well, um, um, I, I'm not sure if you all know that I am based in Egypt. I am located in Egypt and um, I used to work uh, at DAR. Um, five years ago and during my work we always used to um, not to ever see our clients. <laughs> we might see them uh, by coincidence at the elevator lobby 
So our clients is our relationship with our clients is their OPR or the, the project's program. And um, by being involved with the International Living Future Institute as an ambassador, I realized that I really want to do something else. I want to implement uh, uh, the, the ideas and the philosophies to create a regenerative future and regenerative communities. So I had an amazing opportunity to join an amazing project that made me feel that I want to quit my job and I want to take the risk and, and do it. So I will give you a brief introduction to understand what I what I was going through and what that project meant to me and how that impacted my mindset, my, my, my mindset and um, my philosophy towards regenerative approaches. You know that Egypt is located in the arid region where we have the arid climate and uh, we used to build our buildings to respect the climate and the culture and the communities and and the, the place and the people. So we used to do it before, but right now that is unfortunately the case as this is Cairo um, and Cairo is one of the world's most populous Arab cities in the world. And when we started to come up with ideas to create a new capital, as you can see here, as you can see here, we, we started to build skyscrapers. And maybe this is a question. Is it our like best solution? Uh, the project I was telling you about is in Sinai, uh, in St. Catherine Protectorate. Uh, uh, and when we started that project, it was like um, it, it was like an initiative by two NGOs, Handover and Catherine Exist. They wanted to create a community center for the Bedouins there because they had like lack of uh, uh, health care facilities. They have like their their own uh, um, arts and 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 culture and they wanted to. This is like a touristic area. People like to go and 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 have like a day or two there. So they would like to 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 have a place where they can share their experience and share their culture with the tourists and also to have a gathering area for the community to to enjoy to, to enjoy the place they are living in. And uh, we started that uh, that project through a participatory design approach with a group of uh, uh, students and graduates. We started to take workshops and me as an ambassador, I, I, I gave them an introduction about the living building challenge and the good news that it ended up to be the first living building registered project in the Middle East and North Africa. So we registered the project and we started our journey here and we we started with the framework of the biophilic design. Uh, so we, we started to learn about the community and the Bedouin and we started to to see how stereotypes about the Bedouins that they are harsh and aggressive is is so untrue and we found that they are they really like to, to they are so much family oriented and the the men they are like to help their 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 family making bread and the women sometimes you just have this stereotype that they don't have any role they have a very strong role in the Bedouin community and they they are really having this like like art uh, artistic stuff they they have they, they do the beads and artifacts and we started also to know and understand their their lifestyle. What do they like to do? Trekking and hiking is like their their daily life activity. Even their medicinal herbs, they were so much talented knowing what kind of herb can help you feel much better. And I tried that myself and it had, it helped me a lot like magic. And we also started to learn about their 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 problems. They have a lot of kidney problems because of the the lack of filtered water. And we started to learn from them about their technical ecological knowledge to how to recreate what they used to do in in the in the in their in their in, the, in their past. They used to to have this technology that helped them filtrate water, but unfortunately, they started to forget about it. Even when they started to think about right now, when they think about building new buildings that they used to build with nature, right now they build with cements and and the, the traditional ways. So we started to look at that in a perspective, in a regenerative perspective from driven from people. We learned from them how to do it. it it's, it was not our ideas. 
and we started to build with nature using their natural uh, their natural materials and using rocks from the mountains and using rammed earth techniques to build our community center and that was that was really a very a very much learning experience to all of us even the bedouins themselves they felt that they are very happy to see that they can use their surrounding materials like their past and have their own uh, their own buildings in harmony with nature we we even try to to mimic nature we we learned from them they told us about this we later knew that its name is caddis fly larva they they told us that its name is abu fry we googled it everywhere until we we knew what is it it's 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 a larva that creates its shell or its home from whatever local material it has so we started to understand and learn a lot about that larva and we came up with a biomimicry design approach to come up with ideas that help us in the design so we created that unit inspired from the caddis fly larva and that unit is an adaptable unit that could be used as a shade it could be used as a furniture or a unit to display uh, they can display their art and products on it so that was also a very inspiring learning experience how to to learn from the the nature and how to mimic the living organisms around us so we created our uh, our our buildings using the mind shift that happened to us and we created the community center and until now unfortunately it's still under construction but as you, as you can see this is our first product this is a clinic where it is it served so far more than 2000 people where they can have like volunteers from doctors who can come each month and help them with medicine and and uh, and help and, and help the, the community there well we, we realized that we can how can we scale up how can we implement this on our project on our cities and our communities we realized that we need to have like this regenerative approach where where it's not like nothing it, 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 it it's an incremental approach this is like a process that should be that should start from a core then we can we can understand it and ideate it and create then replicate the whole process and in order to do that to do that we need to have a core for this process so we were we, we realized that we need to have this enabling environment where this environment could help us do that regenerative uh, approach and increase and scale up our ideas for for regenerative uh, regenerative buildings and i believe that if we follow that this could be considered as an advocacy tool where we can change our current situation and 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 i realized that learning from people who are living in places where there is no much technology uh, we realized that this is this could could help us create a lot of ideas that helps us in the future. So I believe that this whole experience was very inspiring for me and it taught me a lot how to rethink, to design or redesign our communities. Thank you. Oh, thank you very, very that was fantastic. I really think what really jumped out was learning from the people who were there and not prescribing a choice. So really learning from them and celebrating the kind of history of the culture as well but also that enabling environments i think that's something that we're kind of running into in lots of places so thank you very much and i hope people have lots of questions about that at the end as well i would i could ask questions about that all day myself right so next up we're gonna have duncan baker brown so it's lovely that it's a flip on me introducing you this time duncan so duncan is a practicing architect an academic and an environmental activist he is the Climate Literacy Champion at the um, School of Architecture and Design at University of Brighton. He's on the RIB Council, has done part of ACAN's Circu uh, Circular Economy CPD, and is a member of the Brighton and Hove City Circular Economy Oversight Board. So Duncan is also the author of the Re Reuse Atlas, which is a designer's guide towards a circular economy. He's practiced research and taught around the of sustainable development and closed loop systems for more than 25 years as well. So Duncan is currently working on schemes for net zero social housing with Brighton and Hove District Council, but he's recently led on the drafting of their soon to be published circular economy route map. So I'm going to toss across to Duncan and you can take it away and give your part as well. 
Thank you, Scott. I, and thank you for Kieran and Amira for those amazing presentations. Uh, uh, I could have just carried on listening to you guys all evening rather than listen to myself have to speak again, but uh, I'm going to share my screen now. OK, uh, good evening, everybody. Yeah, my name is Duncan Baker Brown. Um, yeah, I'm an architect, academic and environmental activist. Uh, yeah, one day after this, what happened? Uh, not really very surprising, but yeah, I can't believe uh, what happened over the weekend. Uh, so what should we do next? Well, apparently that's the case. Um, we love fossil fuels more than we love anything else. Uh, I think we are as a society, as a group of human beings, uh, climate emergency deniers, it can be the only thing. And why should we care? Well, there's no vaccine for the climate and ecological emergency. So why us in the construction sector? Well, we consume about 50% of all the world's mined and harvested raw materials annually. And it's the environmental destruction associated with this that um, Kieran pointed out uh, that is one of the main factors for generating the current mass extinction of species. And uh, we are consuming more and more. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, the world, humans extracted from the world between 45 and 60 billion tonnes of raw materials. It's about 100 billion tonnes now. Um, yeah, and the, in the UK, we consume 600 million tonnes of products a year. That generates about 200 million tonnes of waste. And the construction sector generates 60% of that. That's 120 million tonnes of material going to landfill and incineration. On top of that, uh, the construction sector generates about 45% of all carbon emissions. So humankind needs to learn how to manage planet Earth's resources. This much we understand. And it's about the managing of resources and dramatically reducing the need to consume new raw materials. That's the big challenge. And it's us that makes those choices. We choose the materials that we make our buildings out of. Um, I got this from someone I, I haven't been able to uh, track the guy down, but it's a great stat. This is about the fact that if you're in the design and construction sector, uh, you can have more impact in your life, sorry, in your job than you can in your life perhaps. So if you design a 10 meter by 10 meter concrete slab and make it 50 millimeters thinner than normal, you'll save as much CO2 as avoiding meat for a year. Uh, we exist as a linear economy at the moment. We take, make, and we throw away. We rock up at a place that could be fertile and lush and we consume the hell out of it. We turn it into a desert and we move on. No other system in the natural world exists like that. The rest of the world exists like this in a sort of biosphere, a circular biosphere. Um, and this is what we've got to do. We've got to create circular economies. Um, and that's what I'm sort of passionate about. Closed loop systems emulating the rest of the natural world, which we're part of. Because uh, we don't just deal with organic compostable stuff, which is the biosphere, we've also got this thing we have to deal with, which is the tech sphere. And this is where designers really have to step up because we need to make sure that, for example, old BMW cars are a resource for new BMW cars. At the moment, BMW will say their cars are 80% recyclable, but not into brand new uh, BMW cars. So some good news. Well, everybody's talking about it. A case for never demolishing another building. These guys just won the Pritzker Prize this year. Never demolish, never replace, retrofit. This is what we need to look at doing. And we need to do it for numerous reasons, not least because we've got to consume a lot less resources. And reuse is a big deal. These people are irritating a lot of other people at the moment. And can you believe with the strap line, insulate Britain, how dull is that? It's a big deal. Over 80% of today's built environment will be with us in the UK in 2050 when we need to be net zero carbon. And yet we're in a world at the moment where we can't occupy the buildings that we've already built. We've got so many half occupied, half empty buildings in our financial districts all over the world now. Will we ever occupy these buildings again? Why are we building anything? We've just got a lot of empty buildings at the moment, have we not? Uh, the other thing I proffer is that we should close all conventional mines. Does anybody know anyone that works in the mine? Maybe you do, but it's not a place that humans should be really. So we should stop sending people into these horrible open cast or underground mines, and we need to mine the Anthropocene. So in effect, reuse 
the stuff that's already been processed, the stuff that's lying around in our oceans, in landfill sites, our cities, the stuff you're sitting on, creating the shelter that you're within. That takes the pressure off the natural world. And then the natural world, we can nurture and allow it to do what it did the, during the first lockdown, which is to crawl back, run back, reoccupy uh, past places and uh, yeah, grow again and allow us half a chance of surviving. Um, I wrote a book about it, The Reuse Atlas, which focused on the steps towards closed loop systems. The step, first step being the most basic one where you recycle. Recycling's OK, but if you recycle material, uh, you use energy, you create waste and you lose the sort of provenance of the material. The, uh, uh, the hierarchy of it is normally you create a take a relatively sophisticated product and you melt it into just plastic or whatever it is. It's not so sophisticated. So step two is a lot better. Now, these are steps towards closed loop systems, the circular economy. So the way the book worked is it had examples in each of these steps of projects out there uh, delivered on budget and on time that use these techniques. So reuse, as I say, is a lot better and I'll be talking a lot more about that in a minute. Reduce is what Lakatan and Basala famous for doing. They uh, turn a situation which would be a high consumer of resources into one that might not use many at all. And in step four, you're looking at closed loop systems, the real deal the circular economy. So I'm going to start with something called urban mining, which is where you search for new material sources to reduce the need for natural materials. And this is where our cities are so important because it's where most humans live. The greater proportion of humans live in cities. If you're in the UK, it's 80 percent. And cities are material stores for the future. They used to be up until the 20th century and they will be moving forward. So reusing existing stuff might be a sort of ordinary looking as this. That's a before and after shot of a Victorian house in Brighton with six apartments in it, six flats. Um, we worked on that and I could spend the next 25 minutes telling you what we did, but we reduced its carbon footprint by 80% and we didn't demolish the building at all. This is Lacatana Basal who famously um, didn't demolish this tower block which was up for de demolition. There it is on the left in Paris. Uh, the mayor of Paris had put aside the funds uh, to demolish that tower and then to rebuild it. Uh, and it's a residential tower and it's going to be rebuilt as a residential tower afterwards. So Lacatan and Vassal went to the mayor and they said, we can give you a new tower for two thirds the price you're expecting. And this is how they did it. They didn't demolish. They just took off the nasty facade and, and uh, plugged on uh, this uh, sorry, this winter garden, which is two layers of sliding double glazed units, an extension to the apartment and a balcony, and it's created an amazing environment. So the, the, from the mayor's point of view, they got their new apartments. The community stayed on site while this work was done, and that's the problem with demolition. You were demolishing communities as well as buildings, and this is the before and after shot. So no work was done to the actual apartments apart from taking off the facade you can see from the inside on the left, and bolting on these winter gardens, which gave you a lot more ventilation, a lot more light and extension, and an ability to um, adapt the environment as you want. You weren't overheating in the summer or freezing in the winter as before, and also you weren't turning lights on inside during the day because it was so dull. This is just a win-win-win, and the ultimate uh, bottom line is that also for the occupants who are retired people, uh, the utility bills were reduced by 40%. Um, this is another way of doing it. This is mining uh, the cities, urban mining, uh, to find all this material for this, what's called the Brighton Waste House. Uh, we designed and built this in partnership with over 350 students, uh, students of design, students of construction. And we set ourselves the task of constructing a building. It's not a house, actually. The Guardian newspaper called it a house. Uh, it's actually a two story teaching facility on campus at the University of Brighton where I teach. And um, we said, right, let's at the time we designed this building uh, for every five houses uh, built, one house worth of waste went to landfill or incineration in the UK. It's a bit better now. It's like one uh, uh, every seven and a half houses uh, we build before we have one house worth of waste. But it's still a lot of material being thrown away. 
And we said, well, I reckon we can build a, a building, construct a building to passive health standards using construction waste. And we did. About 90% of what you're looking at there is material other people threw away. Um, but along the way, the, pro the project sort of changed a bit and we started uh, collecting plastic, thinking of the things that we threw away on a daily basis. And this was just about the time where all the DVD shops uh, around the UK and around the world closed down because everybody was streaming. So suddenly there are these waste streams that nobody thinks about. So the waste house ended up being this sort of vessel containing products without an end of life strategy. Think about what's the end of life strategy for the thing you design. In this case, you, we collected 25,000 toothbrushes from Gatwick Airport, from the aeroplanes landing uh, at Gatwick Airport that have flown across the Atlantic. So think of the life cycle of this material. It was a fossil fuel processed into plastic, processed into a toothbrush, put on an aeroplane in New York, flown across the Atlantic, landing in Gatwick, Gatwick to be collected and burnt. That's the life cycle of that material and that product. This is us trying to quantify the materials, 55 tonnes of stuff we diverted from landfill and incineration. And it's attracted other projects. So this is a project, an interreg uh, EU funded project, where we were charged with uh, locating linear waste streams near the waste house and sort of turning them back on themselves and turning them into construction materials. And one of the things we found right near the waste house was oyster shells, just one restaurant throwing away 55,000 oyster shells a year. And we also found duvets because big uh, duvets and bedding in Brighton is a big and around the uh, UK and beyond is a big waste problem. In Brighton at the moment, if you're a student and we have two universities with lots of students, we also have hotels, lots of people using bedding. Uh, it's cheaper in Brighton to buy a new uh, duvet than it is to throw one away. So we were, you can see this table full of experiments using uh, fe actually feathers from the duvet. Some of the duvets had feathers uh, to reinforce uh, clay that we collected on site, as well as using those duvets as uh, insulation. But then you've got the oyster shells uh, that we turned into these tiles. So Ben, who made these tiles, the tile he's actually holding is 100% oyster shells. Um, some of the oyster shells we fired at 900 degrees so you to create quick lime so that's a carbon footprint and um that's why this is recycling not reuse and uh, then the rest of the oyster shells we used as aggregates and you mix them together with the uh, quick lime that's formed out of the fired oyster shells with a bit of water and you get this paste and it uh, put it into a mold and three days later you have got a tile which um oh, for the next 50 years will be absorbing carbon as it hydrates the, one, the ones that are slightly pink have got uh, construction aggregates in them, like bricks and what have you. So that's a, a waste source. And this is a client of mine who's uh, constructing new housing in the East End of London. And he just sent me this photograph on the left, which is a shot from his mobile phone. He had excess spoil on site, which he has turned into hand-thrown bricks for the next project he's doing. They're non-load bearing because they're not fired, they're air dried. So that's a client, a commercial client, thinking about the resources and the resource flows from his site. These guys deconstruct buildings that other people uh, just demolish. So that you read these slides from the top left to the top uh, bottom right. So it's a rotor unpacking a building, deconstructing a building, and they have the digital and physical net, um, resources to allow this material to be distributed. Uh, into the uh, sort of supply chain of new construction projects or retrofit projects. This is Maori United Architects in Maastricht. This is a, an empty tower block uh, in the region. Uh, there's depopulation in the region, so they've got these big buildings that are empty. And it was due for demolition, but this one got cut up with an angle grinder and uh, they used the con concrete um, infrastructure of the building to create new houses like this. So that would have normally been blown up, smashed up. This is yes, more straightforward. We could have heads up, Duncan. You've got kind of two or three minutes left. So just a wee heads Thank up. Thank you, matey. That's, that's all I need. Thanks, cheers. OK, so this is a, a more everyday example, but it's uh, Cleveland Steel who um, uh, needed a new building and they found the existing building uh, in Dublin. They're based in the north of England. They deconstructed the building and reconstructed it where they needed it. They saved a million pounds doing that. It was a five million pound project. They saved 995,000 pounds 
by reusing an old building, an existing building. Uh, this is number one, Triton Square in London, lend lease for British land, big commercial property. And this is where I'm going to, this is the last slide I'm going to use actually, because I want to dwell on it. This is a larger scale project in a financial district in the UK. Financial districts around the world are the highest consumers of resources. This is the sort of building that when it gets built, first of all, the interior is expected to last about three months because as you lease the floors, everybody wants their own branding. So you do some sort of uh, benign interior that um, to show off the space and then the occupiers put their stamp on it. That material gets thrown away after three months or so. Um, this building was only 19 years old actually, and it was due for demolition. And instead of demolishing it, they deconstructed the facade uh, because the building was only 20 years old, the supply chain was still alive and kicking. So they went to the original suppliers of the facade and said, if we deconstructed it, would you help us? Could we clean it up? We'll update the glazing mullions and then we'll reinstall. And they did that with all the warranties and guarantees required because the suppliers of the original system were still around. So that's the sort of one benefit of this quick tight turnaround of consumption. The supply chain is still there. So maybe a lot more larger commercial properties uh, will learn from this. I mean, they save 33 and a half thousand tons of concrete because they didn't smash that building up and then rebuild something pretty similar in its place. So I'll end, ending on this slide, I'd say <laughs> reeling as we are from COP26 and uh, um, uh, what didn't happen there. We do need to act now. There are a lot of people at a lot of different scales actually having a good go at this. So these are transformative, exciting times. We not, might not have the leaders we need at the moment, but we will do and things are changing fast. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. For, oh, is that working? Uh, uh, aye. But oh, that was absolutely fantastic. And I think just to really stress a couple of points from here, Duncan's shown that you can have more impact in the work that you do than just your lifestyle choices. So you're not just a consumer. So that's a very, very important thing. And also just the one quote, I'm probably going to use this some more time later, but the problem of demolition is not just demolishing buildings, you're demolishing communities and spaces where people live. So that's something really quite powerful to take. And that's fantastic. I'm really glad we had that contribution. And now we're going to move on to our final speaker for the evening. So we're going to have James Todds. Uh, James Todds, James is an Associate Director at Archetype. So James joined Archetype in 2000 and became an Associate Director in 2015. He's passionate about design that builds on Archetype's in-depth research into passive house, life cycle carbon, natural uh, materials and building performance. James is a project leader for the Enterprise Centre at the UEA, which is an exemplary low carbon building certified to both pre outstanding and passive house standards, and very significantly featured in COP26's virtual pavilion for the World Green Building Council. So you can actually see more about that there. Uh, other projects that uh, James is involved with are the Royal Parks on Greenwich Reveal Project and a circular office retrofit to Enfort Standard for the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. And importantly, before working at Archetype, James earned uh, got some practical experience at the Centre for Alternative Technology, so working as a builder, so taking that knowledge and putting it into practice. So working with materials such as rammed earth, limecrete, straw bale and timber framing. So thank you very much for agreeing to take part, James, and I look forward to learning more from this as well. Uh, you're welcome, Scott. Thank you. Uh, I mean, and to follow on from uh, Duncan's comments, I mean, amazing talks tonight uh, and really fascinating. It'd be great to see uh, more from everybody. Uh, and particularly, uh, two points really, I think, that come through from the previous talks. One is this whole sense of, um, you know, this real intimate connection with the materials that you're using as an architect and the story and the life that they have outside the product. A project is not just a case of that materials appear in the marketplace. You just purchase them sticking in a building. It's about, uh, you know, how do you understand about what the real life and impact of those materials are when they finally arrive in your building site? And a lot has happened before that point. Uh, in some ways, I wish I was I was talking a little bit more about uh, some of the other projects we're doing where we are doing retrofit because I totally agree with Duncan that retrofit is definitely the future for architecture, and that's where the focus really needs to be. Uh, if we have any chance society of, of kind of getting anywhere near the climate goals that we need to achieve. Um, but I'm, why I'm going to talk to you tonight uh, is focusing on um, a building that I worked on, uh, which is at the Enterprise Centre at UVA, where we really tried to explore this idea of we're kind of working with nature 
and looking at how we could use Biobase products to complete uh, all the kind of functions of the building through the whole envelope, uh, technically to deliver a really high performance uh, product. Um, so uh, I'm Jane. So as Scott said, I've, I've always been kind of passionate about working with, with kind of natural materials. This is a picture of um, land earth, unstabilised land earth, uh, built in the UK at Centre for Alternative Technology in Wales, um, at the Attec building, so that was in the, towards the end of the 90s. Uh, we're sort of taking local soils and turning that into the kind of superstructure of the building, uh, really kind of low impact solution, which is still standing today, uh, incredibly effective technology. And I've worked for most of my career with a practice called Archetype, and Archetype have always been very interested in, in developing kind of uh, bio-based low impact solutions. And over the years, when we started uh, out in the 80s, these were quite small solutions, <laughs> uh, looking at using kind of bio-based materials, non-toxic paints, and really investigating where materials came from, trying to use them in a really efficient way. And then that's developed and scaled up over the years, uh, looking at kind of prefabricated timber construction, uh, how again we can kind of use bio materials in a really efficient way to create uh, the entire kind of uh, fabric of a building. And it also we've explored a whole range of different kind of construction techniques. This is a project in, in Taunton where we work with straw bale, we work with land earth and clay blocks uh, to investigate their potential with the uh, kind of um, construction college. It's a really interesting project. Uh, and over the years, those projects have scaled up. So this is a kind of, again, a totally bio-based uh, uh, near Passive House building uh, primary school in Wolverhampton. And th through that process, uh, we got the opportunity to work on the project which I'm going to talk about tonight, which is kind of taking that journey that the practice has been on in terms of investigating how we build uh, low impact buildings in terms of their embodied impacts uh, and using kind of high levels of bio-based materials uh, through to a kind of larger scale. So uh, this is a project that we were commissioned to do through a OGU design competition. Um, it was a kind of collaborative project working with the University of East Anglia along with INCROPS, Knowledge Research Park, uh, and also the kind of ADAPT Low Carbon Group to promote low carbon technology at the university. Uh, and it had a fantastic brief. So the client themselves are really passionate about the idea of investigating how a building uh, on the university campus, which has been dominated by very heavyweight carbon intensive uh, concrete uh, buildings, how they could deliver high performance, uh, but with a kind of radical reinterpretation of how you go about doing that with the idea of trying to drive down the overall impact. And also about how that can then influence the local economy and local press, how it can represent uh, the local area. So again, rather than kind of building with generic materials of a kind of marketplace, it was about kind of investigating what you could find in the local context and how those then could be brought to bear in the project. Uh, so what does that mean in practice? I mean, in summary, there was a local material mapping exercise that we did, which was to try and look at where those materials came from, where could we get materials locally. Uh, we looked at embodied carbon very carefully through the whole process. That became very important in terms of helping to drive decision making so evaluating it very early on and then revisiting that at every sort of stage to look at VE as well. Uh, looking at where we could reuse products and recycle products and looking at the idea that Duncan was talking about, about this idea of, kind of cascade. So how to avoid, particularly bio-based, the worst case is it cascades immediately from a bio-based solution to being incinerated. Actually, the wonderful thing with kind of timber products is there's a whole potential to create an industry where those products can be at first use a high grade material in terms of maybe structure and then become something again really useful like a ball product and then become something like insulation. Uh, so there's actually a whole range of uses that can come out of that one piece of, of timber from the woodland. And then also about what impact that might have on people's health. So how actually the connection between materials and nature and the feeling that creates and what that does to people's kind of sense about their relationship with the environment around them and how that can kind of be transformative. So this is the kind of material map that we produced for the project, uh, looking at what was available. Some things turned out not to be possible to source and more difficult. Again, we had to work uh, with the contractor Morgan Sindel and kind of build relationships with different suppliers locally. We did a lot of work with the Forestry Commission with Thetford Forest, looking at the potential there to get wood out of the forest for construction. Again, it's a lot of 
woodland in the UK, not necessarily that much is used in construction, uh, which is a real shame. Looked at the idea of kind of hemp for insulation because that's grown locally. Uh, chalk was available, flints. Um, so a whole kind of exercise, which also was a kind of engagement. Uh, again, yes, so there's been this research project which is really useful, looking at kind of low carbon supply chains and the woodland potential within the region. Again, at this point in time, most forestry, everything was going straight to very low grade uses from federal forest, so straight to uh, fence posts and wood pulp, uh, not into a high value uh, use such as construction. And we also looked at the idea of uh, kind of reed. So the regional uh, area, there's a real uh, traditional use of thatching, but tends to be within traditional buildings. Could that be used in a kind of contemporary architecture? So this idea of these kind of bio-based materials became really kind of baked in from the initial idea. Uh, and that, uh, coupled with kind of learning from archetypes sort of uh, approach over the years, uh, led through into a kind of specification, uh, a kind of approach to whole construction. So that is looking at every layer of the construction and how we can investigate how we build that without falling back on using very high carbon intensive materials. And we looked at an early stage about what that might mean to sequestration. So I mean, timber sequestration of carbon, the storage of carbon with materials is a complicated area. Uh, it's not a simple idea. It's not as straightforward to say that uh, all that carbon that's captured uh, is necessarily a kind of positive thing that at the end of life it potentially gets re-emitted back into the atmosphere. Uh, but uh, it is a kind of principle that um, as we move forward in time, we just simply won't be able to afford to, as a society to dispose of products in the way that we do now. We're going to have to think about how we reuse them. So I think, you know, at the end of most buildings' lives that are being built now, there'll be a very different end of life picture. Where we'll be looking very hard at how we can take this resource that we've created and how we can then reuse them as high value products. So then just looking at some of the examples here of, of the sort of challenges and, and uh, engagement that has to happen to kind of make these things come to life within the project. So uh, rather than just going down to Timber Merchant, we went down to Sector Forest and explored what timber was available. There were there was uh, species like Corsican Pine and Grand Fir, uh, two species that actually have really great structural properties, but uh, and grown widely in the UK, but very rarely used in construction itself. Um, so we managed to take forward uh, the use of Corsican pine within the project. And that creates some interesting problems in that uh, you actually can't stress grade uh, Corsican pine in the UK. So when you produce the timber, you've got to prove its structural function uh, to standard levels with a computer because it would be far too expensive. So we had to get a guy out of retirement and then rather than C24 timber, we have to have C22 timber, which meant the whole structure had to be re-engineered to make that work within the building. Uh, also, it's a natural product, it's not so commonly used, and it has some interesting properties which have to be understood by everybody. So it's about kind of understanding uh, that we're using something here for a purpose. And this is blue stain, uh, which forms uh, on Corsican pine, but doesn't affect the structure. So we have this kind of blue staining on the timber, and we had to uh, prove to the client that actually this wasn't a problem. Uh, it didn't affect the performance of the building, and it was a natural uh, process within the wood. And so this uh, process of kind of using bio-based materials, so the construction is essentially built in every layer with timber at different stages of its life. So from uh, highly engineered products from the frame to the timber studs from the local forest, ball materials from wood chip, insulation from recycled newspaper, forming also the acoustic attenuation, uh, external boards also formed from wood, um, recycled wood. And another aspect of the project was uh, looking at working with the local thatching community. So th the idea of kind of investing in the technology of thatch and, and scaling that up, giving thatchers the opportunity to work on a large scale commercial building uh, and working out a season within their own barn. So we combine this idea of kind of prefabrication with the thatching uh, and created uh, a thatch panel system which can have the building to celebrate that. And that's kind of been really interesting was a really interesting process in that uh, kind of brought together this very traditional technology with batches with their uh, smaller scale projects and uh, ways of working in interfacing with a very big contractor 
uh, Morgan Sindel, how was that going to work? Uh, how would they meet all the kind of uh, risk and controls that need to be there for a big modern construction site? Um, so it showed the kind of level of investment and work that needs to be done to make some of these kind of uh, newer, more interesting site materials available uh, for modern construction. Um, this is Stephen, he's the master factory in East Anglin. This is the first thatch panel that was developed um, and he's with his hoover to get the eggs out for where the chicken had laid the eggs behind the panel in his barn. And there's the thatchers thatching the panels and then they came through onto site uh, and formed part of the architecture. Here's some example of the local flints forming the roof, local thatch uh, on the sides. So another example in the project to, of kind of reuse uh, on the facades and cladding was uh, within the university uh, designed by Dennis Lasden, there was uh, plant rooms full of these old lab desks. Uh, so the project manager turned up a meeting and said, I've just been down to this plant room, there's just piles of wood. And so we went down and had a look at it, got the original architect out of retirement to come and tell, try and tell us what this wood was because nobody could identify it. And it turned out it was a Roco. So uh, we worked then to kind of reprocess that uh, timber into external cladding for the building uh, on large scale. Uh, again, that hit some regulatory problems. It didn't have uh, kind of FSC certification, so sustainable certification, uh, but we had to kind of persuade the BRE to accept that as part of the BRIAM process. And then uh, reuse. Uh, this is an example, I think uh, Duncan's point was very uh, key about this idea that a lot of, kind of office spaces, uh, people just throw everything away the minute they move in. This is an example of kind of reusing uh, a kind of high spec reception desk. So this is the reception desk in the Sainsbury Centre. It's a cast off. Uh, I think Norm Foster designed a new reception desk in the refit. So we got the old one, did a bit of work to it and used it in this building. We're also doing the same actually in the Passive House retrofit project in uh, central Cambridge. To a large building in central Cambridge where we've managed to uh, obtain a off-cast uh, corporate reception desk uh, and we're currently uh, it's in a workshop being kind of slightly reworked um, and ready for installation so it's like the potential there is enormous to reuse this material and make sense of it. This slide just shows some of the range of materials that went into the interior again the idea of these materials at different stages for their life taking the timber through from something that's kind of uh, uh, highly processed the board through to recycled newspaper shredded within the wood panel. And then what does that result in? It resulted in a building that's both low impact but also very calm, peaceful and a really high quality environment that people really love and that they feel really connects with uh, the region and has a local identity. Uh, and I'm just going to move on then. So that's also uh, kind of played out within data. So we carried out um, a kind of building user survey, uh, asking people as a number of points after completion how they felt about the building. And that's sort of reflected here that there's actually a sort of sense that it led to a more productive atmosphere, more healthy atmosphere with that use of these natural materials and connection to nature. It also performs very well. So all of those natural materials come together and create a building that's passive house that has very, very low energy. And that has an implication for using less materials as well. So if you can get your systems in a building down, you can have smaller things and less stuff and create less impact. So these are tiny radiators rather than large radiators, placing less impact. Um, yeah, just to give a heads up on the last kind of two or three minutes. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to wrap up, Scott. One, three, <laughs> so, so through the process, uh, we did a kind of very comprehensive uh, carbon analysis, looking at all aspects of the carbon impact of the project. Uh, and that was used, I think, most critically was used to actually drive decision making and was contracted on. So the contractor had uh, a kind of target to achieve for uh, embodied carbon uh, right built into the contract, which really, really focused their minds throughout the process and, and enabled us to keep control over uh, the, the kind of nature of the product going into the building. And we've re-evaluated that recently and the building still looks really good from that perspective. So the building is completed in 2016, but it still is below the kind of Reba 2030 target uh, for embodied carbon and below the Letty 2030 target uh, for, uh, for upfront carbon, including biogenic storage. And when you bring all that together, it makes a big difference. So 
This is a new building, so you still have an impact. Uh, up not far on the left, this is cumulative carbon over time. We still have an impact. And I think it's really important to realise that those impacts that have been made when we when we make stuff or do stuff now are uh, impacts that are immediately in the atmosphere. Uh, so you can uh, you can make savings by designing very low energy buildings, but those those savings operationally are only you only get those very slowly, incrementally over time. We don't really have that time. So what happens now is incredibly important. And actually what happens now is construction impacts. So we really do need to focus in on those, not at the expense of operational, uh, but it is it is equally important, I think, uh, as thinking about operation. And that's it. Now, yeah, thank you very much for that. I could, I could probably have watched all of these presentations go on for like double their length, but that's probably just me. But yeah, if all of our panelists would like to turn their cameras on and we can have a bit more of an informal Q&A and any questions you have at all, there are no stupid questions in this room. We're inviting as many as possible. If it gets awkward and there's none, I'm going to invite the panelists to ask each other questions. So there was one that we had so far, just to kind of kick the ball rolling and see if uh, Duncan would like to pick up on this one. So that was just kind of asking about kind of any research into mycelium or ways to use agricultural waste in our buildings. So kind of building links between industries. Would you like to kind of expand upon that a little bit as well? Yeah, I mean, it's something that James, um, James can talk about as well, obviously, uh, and others. But um, yeah, I mean, a couple of things I didn't show. I mean, um, when we were at the, the research project where we did, where we were locating waste streams, we were looking at organic, organic ones as well as agri waste. Um, and the thing to watch out for, and I'd be interested in James' point of view on this, is there's not a huge amount of surplus straw out there. Most, you know, straw has a market. So uh, building with straw is not necessarily a way ahead in terms of mass building. I, I did a, uh, a house in 2008 that was using mod cell, for example, um, load bearing straw, uh, engineered timber and straw panels, but there's not a lot of straw out there. So, um, but there are emerging uh, materials out there and we're doing quite a lot of work with Biome at the moment, who are the UK uh, suppliers of uh, mycelium products. So mycelium being uh, fungi uh, roots. And so we're about to, if they get their BBA certificate, they should have had it three months ago, they don't, <laughs> they don't have it at the moment, but we're hopefully doing two different buildings, a house and a pavilion for Glide One Opera House using these products. And the amazing thing about the mycelium is what it the food stuff it grows with. So, for example, with a with the pavilion we're doing for Glyndebourne Opera House, the the, the mycelium uh, insulation will the food stuff for it is grass cuttings from the site itself, um, and also by and other people around the world doing the research. There's there is a type of fungi that consumes plastic to grow. So, in theory, one day old plastic insulation could be consumed by mycelium to make fully organic biodegradable insulation. The other thing we're doing is using food waste. So um, food, uh, the fibres from food waste can uh, be used, uh, mixed with another organic um, compound that Bio are producing to create tiles and interior finishes. So there's all sorts of things you can do. So picking up on J James's work with the sort of resource map, the harvest map in idea, we're looking at what's on site, not just sort of ambient energies and uh, and maybe human resources, but also just the stuff lying around. So in another project we're working on on the site where the building burnt down, none of that material is going off site. We're using it on site as aggregates, etc., for new materials. Uh, if we're digging up, uh, lucky where I practice, it's on the South Downs, it's chalk. We have hundreds of thousands of tons of chalk going to landfill, etc., every year. Uh, that is a material we can be working with. So we we use it for round chalk walls, for example. I tend to talk about Sort of waste from conventional buildings really because that's <laughs> but um, my passion is that uh, is really uh the organic non-toxic materials uh, the carbon locking materials but just come in on that i think briefly uh, yeah i mean I, I think the important point there and you made it really well there is that it's i think about taking a kind of investigatory and contextual approach to material sourcing which is so it, it, you know, for example, on the, with the thatch on the UEA, it wasn't really necessarily suggesting that everybody should build every building out of that. It was more about a kind of local 
sourcing that in that case there was the, we could get the reed and the straw locally for that project and to, to achieve that actually did mean uh, working with the people actually growing those materials making sure that the harvest was available and scheduling it all in so it would work and actually we had to store material in barns over a number of years uh, you know, to make sure it didn't have a huge impact on the industry at that point in time so again it's kind of uh, you know, I think, and I know Scott, you were talking about this before the talk, the importance of sort of the context of material supply and how you make those decisions. It, it, I think it's sort of, it's again, it's about moving away maybe from this idea that everything's just on the, in a kind of shop for you, but it's actually about investigating what, what can you get locally, you know, what is available. And I think that's a kind of, bit of a mindset change. Well, it was interesting that, that Amira mentioned it as well, I think, with the, with the, um, building that she was working on, uh, you know, so often what you're doing is reintroducing uh, materials to, to to communities, you know, they, t they don't realise the stuff's all around them that they can build with. Yes, uh, I, I believe that being in contact with the community is something very important because vernacular architecture is about this. It's about, it's about learning what is, what we have, and then figuring out how can we and how can we use it and how can we build with it because I believe that this is the most sustainable way and actually this is how we used to build before and this is where, where the, we didn't have this CO2 emissions <laughs> huge CO2 emissions everywhere so I think that thinking locally and learning from uh, the, the people is is a very helpful approach to tackle our biggest problem Right, on, I'm on mute. That's done really well. I'm the first person to do it. But oh, as Kieran said, a 23 fold increase in the amount of building. And as Duncan pulled in, 80% of what we're going to use in 2050 is already standing up. So it's very much looking into the wider context of materials. It's not just specifying concrete for concrete sake or the aesthetic. It's engaging with people and learning from traditional skills and traditional crafts because there's so much richness in what has been done before we started pouring plastic and oil into everything to make everything that much simpler as well. But yeah, uh, Kieran, do you have anything you want to expand on that as well, kind of the context of the materials? And then we'll I'll keep following the questions. I am definitely on top of these. If you put one in, I've got it in a list. No sweat. We're all good. <laughs> no, I think I'm good. OK, so we'll jump to another question. So does anyone have any key tips on reducing the fear and uncertainty for say a contractor, a client or an insurer or side of things about using reclaimed, often rough materials? So especially kind of reclaimed wood and fire worries. So any what has worked in the past? What can we impart to future practitioners on giving them a bit of a head start on how to deal with this? Uh, well, I mean, I can come in nice briefly first. I mean, I think um, the key thing is, is early engagement, really. So it's about bringing everybody together. So uh, I think the example that I showed of the, of the Enterprise Centre, I think that that was enabled enormously by the fact it was a truly collaborative project working with the contractor from day one. So we were able to kind of develop the design with the contractor so they inherently were comfortable with what was being uh, delivered. I mean, I do think there's a, a wider issue, though, that, um, uh, you know, there needs to be. And I, I think that, that it is happening. It's certainly happening outside the UK <laughs> at scale. There's people testing and, and certificating uh, a whole range of new kind of, uh, you know, bio based products. Uh, but but I think we really need the UK to step up and uh, in a way and actually start to uh, properly create the sort of structure to support a smaller industries, particularly meeting, you know, some of the you know, increasingly onerous certification requirements. So I think there's a kind of element there that government has to step in. The industry also needs to step up to support that process. Uh, but as specifiers, I think, you know, we've, you know, we've found that uh, in the end, there, there is a way. <laughs> I mean, and the reality is some of these things are uh, you know, they're the future, but they are a challenge now because they're not common practice. But you can, uh, through persistence uh, and kind of taking this kind of investigative approach, you can uh, um, make these things happen, you know, it's possible and it needs to be made to happen. 
Oh, fantastic. So we'll take another one. So just open to the floor for anyone who wants to respond. Uh, so we've had, what do you think about the idea of minimalism into architecture and materials? So minimalism, perhaps kind of simplification, uh, using less materials. Does anyone have any thoughts on how that kind of can be done? We'll toss that to Duncan, if you want to jump in as well. Yeah, yeah, it's, one of, it's sort of one of my passions, which is uh, any material turning up on site has to work really hard for you. So um, I did my, was lucky enough to design and build my own house. And um, yeah, it was only on site for five months. And one of the reasons is because I was determined not to make any changes on site, because that is the thing that uh, often slows things down. But the other reason is because I try to make sure that any material turn up site did more than one thing. So um, yeah, it, it, whether it's a floor finish, which is also the structure is also thermal mass is also doing a couple of other things um, and uh, and reduce the number of layers. So, you know, my house didn't cost a lot of money to build and uh, the internal finishes are all clay plaster. So it's self finishing plaster that has got a bit of thermal mass, absorbs airborne toxins, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's doing a number of different things. So I think a lot of the time we can create too many layers in construction and too many specialized elements. And I think we've got to just let as a, you know, Scott, you're passionate about are we learning the right sort of stuff? I think we do need to, as, as, as designers, we really do need to understand our materials a lot more and the potentials we have because we're overloading buildings with uh, too many layers of, and in some cases, too many heavy, heavy materials. So we just got too much mass and it's a good thing. Yeah, the Letty and other people are acknowledging this now. I'll let James speak. I'll just make an incredibly quick point. I just think it's quite interesting that, the, uh, you know, we've done a lot of work with passive house design, which kind of advocates uh, looking very carefully at the kind of form factor and kind of, you know, spending money rather on architectural complexity, spending that on the, getting the building to perform correctly. But it's very, it's interesting in a way, a lot of the things uh, that work for operational energy also work for embodied impact. So, you know, the heroic cantilever or the, <laughs> you know, the kind of gesture or the super complex form, uh, they also consume a load of materials as well as making your building uh, being very uh, suboptimal in terms of operational energy. So, yeah, the two act together. So I think eco-minimalism, minimalism, which is a kind of term, is a really interesting idea. And I think trying to, yeah, exactly as Duncan said, look to make everything work as hard as it can in the building. And also, if you, it, you know, also make sure that your buildings are material store for future buildings, always. Yeah, I would build upon James' point. One of my favourite books is also called Eco Minimalism: The Antidote to Eco Bling. It was written by Howard Liddell and is absolutely fantastic. If you can find a copy, find a copy. They're brilliant, and I can't recommend that one enough. Just to throw that in there. I know it's a Q and A, but I couldn't resist. It's a really, really good book. Uh, but yeah, so it just kind of again open to the floor. I've got another question. So, did you find that there was a time difference from using these materials to using conventional ones that you use that used to use? So, how do you persuade your client if the project will take longer to finish? So, kind of the time scales of materials. Uh, Amira, would you like to take this one? Kind of how do you work that into projects? Well. Um... Actually, for our project, they used to build with traditional ways. They forgot about their. They, they used to, to build with nowadays with cement and bricks, and that took them less time, of course. But when they when they they the community was willing to 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 regenerate their their old ways. They they loved their place and they wanted to use the materials that they have, and they knew that we are we are creating a building that that wants to achieve something, that wants to create um, a pilot project for the whole uh, community around it. So people can rebuild their own uh, buildings using the same techniques. So they, they know that this is something like um, they will they will teach the, the young generation their old traditional ways. That was challenging, but they loved that experience. And we found that a lot of people coming and saying that can we reuse these materials for, for creating the, the walls, for example, for the parameters? Can we take it after that and reuse it to create our own homes? Because we really like the idea. So this, this, this made a, a mind shift. When you see the beauty of the process, that encourages people to, 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 to make different selections, to make this cultural shift or like 
I know that in my case, people people just saw how they do, how they used to do things and they tried to do it again. But in 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 our cities, people can just see the beauty of the process and they can be so much encouraged to see something different. When we connect people to the whole process, when you create a story, not just a building, people will invest time to come up with a different product. Oh, that was beautifully put as well. That's I'm going to come back and use that quote somewhere. That was amazing. Thank you very much. You. Oh, this is so much fun. I'm so happy I get to do this. Uh, yeah, we've had another question as well. This open to the floor. So does anyone think that kind of self healing concrete might be more commonly used in the future if that could be made, say, more sustainable or because uh, just as another point to make the the climate we've been designing for is a climate that no longer exists. So we don't quite know how lots of concretes are going to be performing in the future. So if they're self healing, that might sort of mitigate some problems. Uh, would anyone like to come in on the kind of concrete alternatives or healing types of concrete? This is something I'm gonna have to hold my hands up and say I can't I can't contribute very much at this point. So anyone that does would be fantastic. <laughs> uh, Duncan, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I think it's a bit of a peripheral issue. Uh, it's not so important as a lot of other issues. Not, I mean, thank you very much for the question, but we've just got. I mean, from my point of view, what's what's concrete doing above ground? I think it's really got to justify itself a bit more. So, um, you know, I think it's mad madness. Back where I where I am, where I live, we've got chalk. You dig down into chalk, which is the most amazing substrate to work off and then we pour concrete in the hole where we just took out the load bearing strata we put concrete in and it's just dumb you know and building control won't allow it any other way at the moment so we, there's a lot of learning to be done um and uh, we've just got addicted to concrete and a lot of a lot of architects and other people love the look of it but you know i um as a number of people have done on the core i've done ram short round earth you get more out of that than you do out of the uh, a, a bit of uh, shuttered concrete, however beautifully shuttered it is. I tell you that it's just I tell you what one thing, you, a lot of the things you don't need to make such a big deal about with your clients. I think the big deal is the learning we have to do as a community of designers. We've got to do a lot of new learning, get a lot into our heads and then sort of compose new buildings in partnership with our clients and communities and learn from those clients and communities as well. And it's, you know what, it's a lot of work designing buildings and it's not getting any less and you can't really rest on your laurels and think, well, I've done it that way. It's all right. We're in transformative times, but it is up to us. And I think and clients will come to us and say, can you design a building? Yes, I can sort of thing. And then after that conversation, if they've appointed you, as long as you don't get sacked, they're probably going to do pretty much what you tell them to do. So if you tell them that the way to go forward is to cast concrete in situ, isn't it beautiful and take them, take them to a concrete building and show them how lovely it is, they're going to do it because they've invested in you for whatever reason. So you're also that, that situation can turn on its head and just not have any concrete above ground. What, what happens to your building if that's the philosophy you have? Oh, that's a lovely point as well. I've heard anecdotes of people taking clients to Shrubby or Bretched Apple buildings and it's the feel of the building that kind of the air that's different, the, the kind of air quality, the feeling of the space has actually changed the client's mind. So that's something you can also try and bring into your own work. Try and bring your clients usefully place, useful places that give them a nice gentle nudge towards something that hopefully isn't concrete as well. Uh, for this to James. Yeah, I just wanted to, I mean, it's, it doesn't exactly lead on with that, but it's something that Kieran, you know, when Kieran was talking about sand that, you know, reinforced, it, it's something I must admit I hadn't thought about much, which is, uh, uh, you know, the um, challenges with sourcing minerals. And it just resonated with another article in that if you look in the most recent copy of New Scientist, there's an interesting article looking at uh, the kind of risk that with the kind of sustainable industries are actually reliant on uh, you know a lot of these rare earth minerals and a lot of mineral extraction and there's a real danger again that we might actually destroy nature by being sustainable if we don't kind of uh you know look back at where everything is really coming from i, d I don't know whether kieran has uh you know a, sort of any insight on the other materials other than sand because it's i mean certainly to me it's not something that was the top of my list of thinking about this is actually a kind of at a kind of critical uh, issue level, the sourcing of sand, but it seems like a, a number of minerals might also be in a similar position. Yes, 
uh, James, I, I do actually. Uh, in fact, even in some places, even rare earths are being extracted from types of sand, like monazite sand. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, we use the term sand, but it's really a really big, big term, right? For many different types of sand, and that encompasses a whole range of sectors and and this word sustainability, it's 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 really problematic. I mean, it's great because it's loosely defined. It can bring together a lot of stakeholders, but the problem is that it's loosely defined, so you can't really pin down uh, what it really means, right? So sustainability, I know, like, for example, the dredging industry talks a lot about sustainability, but when they talk about sustainability, they're talking about fuel efficiency and economies of scale and stuff like that, which is also sustainability, but they're not addressing the fact that we're talking about a non-renewable resource. Uh, and that is really, really material as far as I'm concerned. So uh, it's it's how we define sustainability. The devil lies in the details, I think. Oh, I couldn't agree on that more. Sustainability, as was taught when I was in architecture school, when it was actually taught, was about damage control. It wasn't about that regenerative process. It was more kind of can you make your project slightly less bad? So it's really great that we're having the kind of discussion on pulling it, pushing it further, as well as kind of cement production is about eight to nine percent of carbon emissions, if I remember numbers correctly. And that's that's huge. It's almost 10 percent. But we don't talk about that as much as we get told to focus on plastics or our lifestyle choices. And don't stress, you can do more in your working life on reducing carbon emissions than just a few tweaks here and there. And we've got another question. So again, if you've got questions, please feel very free because I have run through the last one and I will start asking the panelists to question each other. So if you'd like to have a question, please throw it in. So uh, to James, I think to anyone who's ever sourced furniture for a building. So how do you find furniture from other buildings to reuse in your projects? So it'd be quite nice to hear a bit more of a story about how did you get that desk for the UEA Centre and what was the process in reaching out for kind of furniture of that kind or any furniture for abuse reuse in a building? I mean, I can talk about this briefly. Uh, it's, I mean, I think in both of these cases, it was um, because the project had that agenda. So from the very, everybody around the table understood that we were trying to uh, look for opportunities to kind of reduce impact and reuse uh, products. So people then would volunteer ideas. So somebody you know whereas before they would have skipped this thing somebody turns up at a meeting and goes oh hang on a minute uh, actually we've got uh, this desk around the corner and that's exactly what happened on the other project that we're working on in in cambridge someone just kind of uh, volunteered it basically um i mean that makes it sound uh, I, mean, I mean i think in the end there needs to be much better systems in place to enable uh, I mean, in some ways, uh, if you look on eBay and you're trying to get a new kitchen, uh, have a look on eBay because they just it's similar to the kind of office uh, situation that Duncan's talking about where people just moved off with chuck everything away. There's so many people moving to an, into their house and chuck out a new kitchen and you can get a perfectly new kitchen on eBay. Uh, but, you know, similarly, there needs to be better systems in place to document and enable material sharing. Um, I mean, Duncan may well be able to talk more to that. Well, yes, yeah, certainly when um, when we were doing the waste house and we advertised the fact that we wanted stuff, we, we got sent stuff and we were lucky enough to we did the project in partnership with Brunhouse City Council. And they they in effect gave us storage so we'd receive a pile of stuff and not exactly know what to do with it um, uh, until like maybe two or three months later. So uh, I was going to actually stress that the sort of the role of the designer and architect changes a bit when you've got this sensibility. You know, if you're working with a community and developing an idea with the community, you're not just saying you're going to get this thing. It's wonderful. I'm talented. I'm giving you this thing. It's an exchange. And the same happens if you the problem with buildings where you're using secondhand materials, you don't you know, you can't guarantee what they're going to look like. I mean, our waste house ended up being clad in 2000 carpet tiles uh, The by the way, past fire tests, etc. that we were. And that was the other thing. We it was a reference to, you know, the challenges with building control and with these materials you, you you have to talk to these people early on and get them on board but um i i think it, our role changes um with regards to sourcing furniture i mean we did a, we did the waste house in partnership with freegal freegal uk and um you know there are lots of online uh, organizations where you can sort of swap stuff and and exchange stuff for nothing and 
Yeah, if you if you if you had a project, for example, we got a load of secondhand chairs for the waste house just to use as a furniture, just from a school. We could have had three hundred of the chairs. You know, there there are sources out there. One of the things we look at when we're doing resource maps for potential materials is is current. You know, from building regulations applications, we look at current live building sites near us, and we get we get surplus material from those sites. So there are lots of options. Um, but I do agree that the sort of more formal networks need to be established. They might exist already. It might be Amazon or hopefully not, but um, you know, it's existing databases, but it's the swapping of stuff. Just before lockdown, the first lockdown, there were a Myrog, which is the major infrastructure of whatever, whatever, produced a, a white paper which uh, you know, presented a case for a, a, an online resource exchange. At the moment, you'll have big big builders like McAlpine and people like that. They do swap stuff now from site to site, surplus materials. But we need these companies to be swapping amongst themselves. So it doesn't need to be an exchange of money. It's an exchange of resources. And it just stops those resources being thrown away. And then you can imagine in the city of London or any other financial district, as a, as a building comes down, it's deconstructed and it's fueling the building next door that goes up. You know, it doesn't happen at the moment. But I don't think it would take much, really. Um, I do know of a number of local authorities that have got this idea of uh, creating a remanufactory, which is a, a building that will take these harvested secondhand materials, clean them up, do the R&D that's required as well, but also do what Rota DC do, you know, put these things back out, out into the marketplace. And I think it's only a matter of time, literally months, I think. Oh, that's exciting. So we've got some more fun ones. Uh, that says we've seen. So we've seen some examples of very low carbon buildings. But what are our current roadblocks towards going even further? So, for example, carbon negative projects. So projects that do more good than harm. So I think I mean, if you'd like to talk a little bit about the living building challenge and how maybe that sets it, and we can move from there to anyone else who wants to field that. But what are the current roadblocks to our buildings and our construction sector moving from being? The 40% industry to say the negative 10 at least, because it's got the potential perhaps. So, however, you want to address that question. Yeah, well, um, as you as you mentioned, Scott, the Living Building Challenge have um, another program related to building materials and products. It's it's the Living Product Challenge, and mainly it is about hand printing. Uh, and doing the the the, bodus, the positive stuff that reduce our carbon uh, uh, impacts. So it's it's a matter of an equation. Okay, if we have to do it, so how can we make it up to the environment <laughs> with less harm? So we can figure out ways we can we can change our uh, our traditional uh, uh, systems or we can change our formulas we can come up with ideas so hand printing is mainly the main approach is to as i said it is it's a very simple way to make it up for the environment i did that i i i um, my building or my product emitted that amount of co2 uh, but i have an alternative for the environment i made something positive This is simply this is simply the idea. Right, so even to open that question, like what are the roadblocks right now? Because we have so many technologies. Uh, for example, the Centre for Alternative Technologies Zero Carbon Britain report said in the UK we have all the technologies we need to be a carbon zero country. What are the roadblocks? So, uh, Kieran, would you like to take that? And then we'll pass yeah, it on to as well. I think from, from my perspective, from what I've seen is uh, there's a lack of awareness for one. Um, among different stakeholders, um, including policymakers, um, and, and and that becomes a problem because uh, if policymakers are not exposed to the num num you know various options available, um, then the kind of policies that are getting made are definitely roadblocks. Um, also, uh, because these are novel techniques, and you know we we don't have we've kind of lost. Uh, a lot of skills and community that that we had in the past. And so I think there is a lot of work to be done bringing together community, rebuilding those skills, reskilling, capacity building across different levels. I think uh, these are uh, things that need to be taken into account. 
Right, fantastic. What was your take on that, Duncan? What are the yeah, kind of the results? I mean, I agree with everything Kieran said. Um, sorry, I was just thinking about Alok Sharma crying again. Sorry, I drifted off there for a minute. Um, anyway, wiping a tear. Anyway, that that aside, uh, maybe he needs a bit to go on a bit of the CPD. Um, what I would say is that there is a huge gap between all these reports and uh, that what I'm enjoying reading, um, which are telling us what what we should do, uh, the, the, all that knowledge, and actually what building building control are telling us what to do. So there's a huge gap between what we have to do and what we're advised to do. So it's legislation. There's tax, uh, you know, uh, VAT on retrofit, uh, zero VAT on new build. These sorts of things. Uh, we're actively encouraging the demolishing of our built environment at the moment. So what's anyone going to do? You know, they're going to do what's legal and what's encouraged. So we got the wrong legislation. We haven't got the legislation and we've got the wrong tax uh, in incentives at the moment. And as you can see, I mean, just a stat while I've been reading. Sorry, I shouldn't been looking at anything else, but from COP25, you know, uh, COP26, not one uh, coal project was put on hold. You know, all 500 of them that are live around the, around the world at the moment, big major projects. Uh, are still live, you know. So you can see what the problem is just from the last two weeks. I actually think there's a lack of knowledge uh, and understanding right at the top. They'd rather just talk about electric cars all the time as a solution. That's the thing. There's, there's no ideas. I, I, I mean, the other thing I said is all the interesting people, including you, Scott, were not at the meeting. You know, you're outside making a noise. You're not on stage. And that's not a coincidence. <laughs> But no, it's yeah, lots of the policy. So even uh, just to give a bit more context, so the there was no international regulation on buildings from COP. So the IPCC said three years ago now that all new buildings should be near zero energy and fossil free by 2020. So by last year, that's not the legal regulation in any country yet, which is astounding, seeing as we've been having lots of follow the science rhetoric from lots of governments during COVID, et cetera. But just for our like, final question, because I could honestly ask these all night, this is so much fun, but just around materials, uh, how do we keep materials in high value cycles? So what would any, what would kind of, how do we keep materials in kind of the most high value cycles? And it, we could take this as one, and then if every, anyone ha everyone has maybe a closing kind of, what would you impart to a future practitioner as, your key piece of advice for kind of their future projects, their kind of work as well. So would anyone like to come in on keeping materials and kind of high value cycles and stopping the downgrading? And yeah, we'll throw the gems on this one and then we'll get some closing notes as well. I mean, I think that the critical thing is designing with an idea of how what's going to happen at the end of life with your project. So, um, and you know, critical to that is kind of the idea of demountability. How do you take the building apart? So how you put it together is one thing, but then how you take it apart. I think a quite good illustration of of, of, of the challenges around that are, for example, um, you know, where we've worked with say something like cross laminated timber. You would assume <laughs> cross laminated timber being a big timber thing which is screwed together you could then take that apart lo and behold it's actually very difficult to take it apart the kind of typical fixings that are used uh, to actually assemble uh, a CLT structure rapidly are, are pretty much totally undemountable so it's about um, so if I was so that leads me on to what I would buy something I think you know there needs to be challenge so I mean I think some, we've seen that today but you know we need to challenge the norms about how buildings are made uh, and, and we need to be aware that uh, I think that about this um, the hidden life of kind of both of the materials coming into the project and and the life they're going to have uh, beyond the building you know so it's about uh, trying to see the, the sort of this cycle of, of, the, of the materials rather than them being some uh, glossy shiny artifacts in your project is actually what's more important than that in a way is their life before and the life after your project so it's um, beginning to think and understand in that way um, I think we'll start to make a big difference. Oh fantastic so yeah so we've got lots of lots and lots of food for thought that you could actually immediately bring into any projects that you start to do in uni or in practice and everything from kind of material selection through to resource mapping harvest mapping local materials 
I wish I got this in uni. This would have been so good five years ago. But yeah, so if every, if, I eat, if we just kind of go around the panel kind of in the order that we had the presentations and just if you have one piece of kind of parting advice and encouragement as well for our audience for what they can kind of do next because taking action is important. So what what encouragement do you have and what can they do next as well? So um, I would say um, Sand and gravel are the most exact uh, extracted resource solid substances on Earth. So it's really important to pay attention to where they're coming from, how they're being used. Um, but I would urge you not to get frightened or disillusioned or disheartened by the scale of the challenge. Stand in your power, you know, work with what you have, the skills you have. You are incredibly important and powerful in your own right. And you will then influence so many others through your work and through your actions, um, uh, through through your stories, like like Amira said. So I really love that. Um, so uh, that's the word I'll, uh, I'll end with. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. So Amira, what would you say on your parting shots? Well, I would like to add on what Kiran said um, I believe that my my piece of advice would be to work with the community. We just can't solve our problems by dealing with it, that we are the people who know what the problem is and the community doesn't know about it. We need to work with them hand in hand because I believe that this is how we can all create a, a, a regenerative future and we can we can think together and come up with real solutions, not like we have the solution and you don't know anything about it. This is like a, a, an incremental approach and it needs collaboration, not um, not being disengaged from our communities and our societies. So know the people you are building for and, and work with them. Oh, fantastic. Sorry, you broke up there. Is it, is it my go? Oh, uh, yep, you're up, Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's been a bit of a bad connection for me lately. Um, yeah, look, talking to students, yeah, you, you do have the time at the moment to learn stuff. I think it's really difficult to continu continue learning when you're in practice. Uh, I mean, what I've found inspiring is that a, a number of people that are part of ACAN, Architects Climate Action Network, their practices give them a half day or a day a week to be involved. I mean, this is this is the sort of thing that needs to happen. So urge your practices, uh, the ones you work for, to um, yeah to carry on learning. I think that's what we've got to because it's out there. I agree with with the statements that have been said tonight that we do know what to do. The information's out there, but we're not exchanging it enough at the moment. We're in a rut, too much of a rush. And we've got to slow down and just think. I mean, for you know, for example, I just think you know, building for the future. If you're you're doing it in the UK, uh, the built environment's already there. You're adapting it. You're not you know, don't go building new towns. We don't need new towns. All right, fantastic. So, James, your kind of closing shot for students for what to do next and encouragement as well. Well, I agree with. Uh, everything Ebby said, particularly what Duncan said about the idea that the future really is uh, reuse. So, um, and actually, you know, the industry needs people who really care for and understand how to work with existing buildings. Um, but I think if I was the sort of advice I'd say is, uh, you know, and I think it was touched on before, you know, also got to, as an architect, you kind of, I think we've got to kind of step outside of our comfort zone as architects. Uh, there's the nice, comforting world of looking, how they look, you know, and the aesthetics of architecture. And you've got to step out of that. And that's certainly my experience in practice has been the way we've managed to achieve uh, innovation, actually pushing the boundaries on sustainability is actually by being brave enough to step out of that comfort zone and start to do things that architects don't normally do. So actually doing lots of number crunching and analysis <laughs> and demonstrating to people uh, that these things can work. So you can't just expect to go out there and people are going to say, oh yeah, I'll do that. You have to show people why uh, these things work. Um, and I think if you can, and we can do that. And I think when we start to do that and we start to evidence things, uh, then you can actually change his mind. And, you know, essentially you have to be an advocate uh, for the future. I think that's the thing. It's not going to happen without you standing up and uh, kind of 
stepping outside of your comfort zone to make it happen. Uh, this, okay, this has been an absolute joy. So I'll do the last bit of housekeeping. So for any updates on all kind of upcoming Future Architects events and activities, ensure you follow RIBA Education on social media, so Instagram and Twitter. And I would like, like to extend a huge kind of depth of gratitude to our speakers and panelists for fielding all these questions and bringing all of their experiences to this evening as well. So thank you very much. And this is the end of this evening. <laughs>